Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Basil Hewitt with Sanitation Districts. Thank you for joining us um, for this virtual tour of our Palmdale plant. You know, we, we, we look forward to having a bus tour of our facility once a year, but given the circumstances, we've transitioned to online. Um, so we're really proud to show you virtually our Palmdale plant. This morning, I have with me um, Genesis Rodriguez. Genesis Rodriguez will be handling, uh, moderating the event. So if you have any questions, put it in the, the Q&A. If you want to say something on the mic, raise your hand and she'll unmute you. We also have John Dahl. He's an engineer at our Palmdale plant. And Janine Gonzalez, she's the um, plant, the treatment plant supervisor. So anything you'd ever want to know about the Palmdale plant, these are the two folks that would know it. So um, before we get started, I want to tell you, thank you again for joining us. I know it's a Saturday morning at nine o'clock and you know, probably people are up late watching the Laker game. The, hopefully Sunday turns out better. But I want to tell you a little bit about the sanitation districts. We were created in 1923, as the slides move forward. Um, and this is an actual shot of um, Santa Monica Bay. What you're looking at is raw sewage going into the ocean. And the same thing was happening to our local rivers. So it resulted in life expectancy of in the early 20s. A typical person in Los Angeles County only lived to be about 50 or 55 years of age. So the folks in LA County got together, passed a law that created the sanitation districts. And now we've grown from being just in the South Bay to 24 sanitation districts. You can see all the numbered or lettered uh, areas represent sanitation districts. We're 24 sanitation districts. We're a special, 24 uh, special district, each with their own local board of directors. So we have, we have the buying power of a large agency, but we have local control because each sanitation district, and I have District 20, which is where our tour will focus on, um, each sanitation district is based on drainage area, not politi political boundary. And so if you look at this map, um, so for District 20, the, the mayor of Palmdale, uh, is chairperson board of supervisors, and a city council member from Palmdale sits on our board of directors. So you get local control, but yet the buying power of a large agency. And today we're gonna to focus on the Palmdale plant, which is one of our two plants in the Amarillo Valley. You can see these pins rep represent the 11 uh, wastewater treatment plants um, we have throughout the county. But today we're gonna to focus on Palmdale. And with the 11 wastewater treatment plant, um, next slide, please. Palmdale and Lancaster are the most challenging because they're located in what we call the closed basin. If you look at this map, you see the location of Lancaster and Palmdale plant, and you can see the topography. There are these mountains. So all the water from these two treatment plants are in what we call a closed basin. There are no outlets to the, the ocean or no rivers. So Unlike our nine other treatment plants, where if we have excess recycled water, we can either put it in the ocean or the river, Palmdale is a unique challenge because John, Janine, and all the men and women working at the Palmdale plant have to account for every drop of water. Every drop of water has to go on someplace on dry land. And so that's why it makes Palmdale a uniquely challenging treatment plant to operate and run. And with that, I will um, turn it over to John and Janine. All right, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you very much. All right, everybody, thank you uh, for joining us. Really appreciate that. Uh, you, you taking your time out of your Saturday to, to uh, spend a, a little bit of time with us. So um, <clears throat> this tour is gonna be interactive and uh, we're just gonna proceed through the, the, the water, wastewater treatment plan to talk about the different processes. And uh, as we go along, please feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Um, 
uh, we, we want to make this as interactive as we can. We want to uh, answer any questions uh, you may have. This, this talk is, or this presentation, I should say, is, is for you guys. And uh, we want you to get the most out of it. So, all right, so I'll go to the next slide. Get a little, there we go. All right, so what is wastewater? So wastewater is commonly, when you think of wastewater, people commonly think about the toilet or the bathroom, but wastewater is comprised of many different um, uh, wastes that uh, go into the system. So you, like, like the uh, video, or I'm sorry, the picture here shows, you get the shower, you get a bathtub, you get the sink, you also have your kitchen and you also have your laundry room. So there's a lot of water that's contributed to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. So a lot of people think that uh, wastewater is um, uh, dirty, yucky, something that you don't want, but it's really not the water that's bad, it's what's in the water. And so the water just more or less conveys the waste to the plant for treatment. And then that's where we remove what's in the water to clean it and then, and then reuse that valuable resource. So you see from, from this here uh, how the water or wastewater, if you will, reaches the, your uh, local uh, treatment plant. So <clears throat> it'll go from your house, convey to a local sewer, then onto manholes, which you see in your street and then to a main trunk sir, which then goes to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Okay, so here's an overview of the plant itself. So Palmdale was uh, constructed in 1953. We initially treated uh, 0.75 MGD. Today we treat an average of 10 MGD. Uh, MGD is a, a unit. It stands for millions of gallons per day. And so just to give you a visual what an MGD is, uh, think about a garden hose. So uh, most people have operated a garden hose and the flow coming out of the garden hose itself. Uh, the flow is about five uh, gallons per minute. So if you take 140 hoses and put it all together, that flow uh, equals one MGD to give you an idea of the amount of flow that the treatment plant uh, processes. All right, so uh, this slide here shows a picture of a control room. The operator is looking at what we call a DCS system, a di distributed control system. And this is a, uh, an efficient way of managing and operating the plant. So the operator will, will uh, look at various screens. He could turn off and on pumps right from the computer. As you can see on the screen itself, there's some, some red colored, uh, those are pumps that you're looking at, red colored pumps or green colored pumps. Green means it's operating, red means it is off. Also, you notice in his hand, he has a, uh, like an iPad. So on a daily basis, the operators will walk around the plant and they'll record information uh, of, of, of the different processes. And then he'll come back to the control room and upload that information. And the operators use this information to, to make plant adjustments as necessary. Okay, so here's an overview of the plant itself. Uh, as we go through the plant, we'll talk about uh, different uh, 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 you know, processes itself. Um, and so we'll start with the uh, primary uh, tank. So, so you can see at the lower left, it says inflow pumps. I'll go ahead and highlight here. So you can see it's, it's well below, below grade. Um, Palmdale and Lancaster is a very flat area and the water conveyed to the plant uh, is conveyed via gravity. Uh, gravity is um, uh, much cheaper than than a uh, lift station or a pump station, if you will. So we like to use gravity when we can. The water enters the plant at about 30 feet below grade, and then it's pumped up from there. And I'll show you a picture of the, uh, the pumps themselves. So the photograph on the left is the doorway that goes down into the um, uh, area where the pumps are at. And then on the right is a picture of the influent pumps themselves. Each of these pumps uh, is rated close to 100 horsepower, and they pump 10 MGD of uh, water each. Does anybody have any questions? I thought I'd pause for a second to see if anybody has any questions so far. Um, so what's the system called again? This is the uh, influent uh, pump station. And this is where we'll take the water and we'll pump it above grade to begin the treatment process itself. And what's the system in the control room called? Uh, DCS, Distributive Control System. And so the distributed control system allows the operators to control many 
pieces of the plant from one area. So uh, before the DCS, the operators would have to go out into the plant, um, adjust valves, turn off and on pumps, um, and it was uh, very labor intensive. And by having this DCS system, it's the cost saving measure that the districts do to, um, to control the plant. Okay. Any more questions? No? Okay. So, so this pump station lifts the water up above grade and we uh, pump it initially to the screen structure. Now the screen structure removes large objects from the wastewater and this helps protect uh, downstream equipment as well. Uh, we want to start screening, screening the wastewater and, and cleaning the water. So there's basically three mechanisms to clean water. It's, the three mechanisms are uh, physical, chemical and biological. So as we go through the treatment system, you're going to see one of those three mechanisms employed in cleaning the water. And here's a side video or a, 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 another video showing kind of how the screening structure works. So you can see the large ob objects come along, the, the, the screen will catch it and remove it and convey it upward and then drop it in. So in this video it shows a conveyor uh, but at Palmdale, what we do is we drop it into this uh, uh, grinder compactor. So right in this area here, so here's a chute, material drops in here, and then this grinder then grinds it up and makes it smaller, and then it goes into this compactor, and then from there it's pushed on out to the side. So we'll show you what comes out of our screening structure. <coughs> so here you can see what we pull out. Now, each, and here's a, here's a comment on our uh, flushable wipes, by the way. Um, so <clears throat> just to quickly comment on this, uh, flushable wipes are, although they're called flushable, they're really not something you want to put in the, in the wastewater treatment system. You want to actually throw it away. You don't want to flush it down. And the reason why is that those, those flushable wipes, uh, they'll get in our pumps and they'll clog our pumps. And when that happens, we have to pull the pumps and unclog them basically pull it apart and then rebuild them and put them back in. That's a huge expense. Also, uh, from what, also as you can see in the trash bin earlier, there was a lot of uh, 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 wipes in there as well that we had to remove. And this is a load on your wastewater treatment plant and it adds cost to, to treatment, uh, treating the, the uh, wastewater. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that each plant is unique to the community it serves and so the the waste that you pull out or the objects that you pull out in the screening structure will vary from plant to plant. Up here in Palmdale, we have uh, uh, schools. Um, uh, it's, a, it's also a community. So we see a lot of, a lot of wipes and, um, and um, uh, you know, those smaller type of boxes. We have a question from Jackie. Jackie, would you like to um, ask your question? She has her hand raised. Oh. I, you, I noted that you mentioned flushable wipes are indeed not flushable. What about disposable diapers? Uh, yeah, disposable. Well, disposable diapers, yeah, you don't want to obviously flush those down as, as well. Um, that could create an issue. Uh, it's same as the flushable wipes. It could clog up your pumps. Um, and it's also another load on the wastewater treatment plant uh, in removing it and having to dispose of it. So those objects you, or those items, you actually want to throw away into the trash and dispose of it that, that way. Also, since we're on this topic, um, does anybody have any, uh, well, let me ask you this. So what do you, what would you do with uh, medications? If you have old medications that you're not using, how, how would you dispose of that? Um, Susan, would you like to talk? Yes, um, I take mine to the CVS. Certain CVS have a disposable, it's a bin, you walk in, you pull it open like a mailbox, you drop them in. No flushing, no trashing, no down the drain. You have to put them into a recycling bin at your local pharmacy. Not all the pharmacies have them, but you have to go online and, and figure out which ones do. 
Yeah, that's perfect, Susan. Thank you very much. That is absolutely what you want to do. You don't want to put it down in your drain. Um, also, um, <clears throat> you know, if there's any, you know, if you uh, change oil in your car or things like that, of course, uh, you can take it to O'Reilly's or one of the one of those places, and they'll they'll accept it for free. So it's no cost to any of us uh, to to return it, and um, and it's and it's what we want to do. And someone, uh, Danny has a question. Can the government do something about labeling or how those flushable wipes are called labeled? Good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very good uh, good point to bring up. So, there ha I have recently seen some uh, news articles that some cities are starting to restrict those uh, quote unquote flushable wipes. Uh, you know, technically they are flushable because you can flush them, but you don't want to flush them. And so some cities are are realizing, hey, this is really causing a problem in our plants. And we're going to um, <clears throat> have, uh, you know, local ordinances to remove them off of the shelves of the, um, uh, you know, the stores that sell them. So, so there is some movement in that direction. I think that will continue on uh, down and eventually it gets to the point where uh, these uh, uh, flushable wipes will not be permitted to be on the shelves or at least uh, the current versions of them. the manufacturers may change the composition of them to where they are uh, biodegradable or more biodegradable. Uh, and, and in that case, and they, they'll be fine going to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so just a couple more before I, I let you move on, John. Um, so you mentioned that removing them is a great expense. About how much is that expense if you had to give a price? Oh, you know, um, <clears throat> it's, it, it, it's kind of hard to Say exactly. So that, that bin you saw in the video, we, we changed out the bin probably, uh, well, we changed out twice, twice a week at least. And so the tree, the, and it goes to waste management, which is a landfill. So that, that portion uh, of the waste that's removed go, is landfill. Um, and they charge us by the weight. And uh, it, it, as far as the dollar, exact dollar figure, I couldn't exactly tell you. Um, you know, you know, there's other expenses also. You got to think about uh, the pumps that got to get rebuilt. Uh, you know, there could be anywhere around you know ten grand a pump to rebuild it, depending upon what needs to get replaced or cleaned out. Uh, it, and it's also a pump that's taken out of service. So, in when we design a plant, we always uh, have redundant systems. We had five pumps in that wet well, uh, and we only need one or two or or maybe three at the most to run, um, but it takes away a, uh, a pump off the system or, or something out of line that we could use for running the plant itself. And, and so I, I don't know if I'm really answering the question. I'm kind of talking a little bit around it, but uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't have the exact number, uh, what it costs, but it, 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 can, it, it does cost, it is at a cost to the plant itself. And how much does, uh... How much wastewater does it purify every day? Did you say it was one MGD? So the, the plant originally, when it first started operating, was uh, 0.75 G MGD, one, less than one MGD. Today, we do an average of 10 MGD. So, and, and thank you for asking that question too, by the way. Uh, so the, the plant flows, they kind of go up and down throughout the day. So they'll, they'll peak at some point in the day and they'll go lower at another point of the day. Can anybody, does anybody have any idea when the plant flow will go up or when it goes down? Does anybody want to take a, a shot at when that may occur or why it may occur? Let me just say MGD means million gallons per day. Yes. So I you. think earthen, I think earthen has uh, an answer. Earthen, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, I'm assuming in the morning because that's when people use the bathroom the most. Yes, absolutely. So in the morning, we'll see uh, the peak start to rise up because people are waking up. Uh, they're getting ready to go to work. They're taking showers or cooking breakfast. Um, so they're using um, they're, they're using their treatments or they're they're using their facilities, and so our flow will will start to go up then. And then once everybody goes to work. Uh, the flow will start to go down a little bit. And then once everybody comes back from work, the flow will go up a little bit. So we have this diurnal flow that goes up and down. Does anybody want to take a guess of uh, when 
our busiest time of the year would be, our, our largest flow of the year would be? We had uh, Edward in the Q&A who put rain events and Danny who said rain as well. Okay, yeah, so, so rain events can add to the uh, load on the treatment plant or increase the flow, um, but it's not our most significant flow. There's a, a particular date or time I'm looking for in the year. Virginia, would you like to take a guess? Virginia, no? Okay, we'll have uh, Eric. Eric, would you like to take a guess? <coughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, there are a couple of guesses. Uh, uh, Jasmine says the Super Bowl and Jackie says Thanksgiving. Yes, actually both of those. Um, usually Thanksgiving, but uh, Super Bowl also. Um, thanks, using Thanksgiving example, people, everybody's home, your families are there, you're cooking, there's a lot of activity going on, and so our, uh, our flows will, will increase significantly during that day. Uh, also Super Bowl as well. So when, you're, uh, when the operators are, so going back to the DCS screen that we had uh, earlier, the operators can see the flow as it goes up and down there. And so um, during Super Bowl, you know when it's uh, halftime because all of a sudden the flows will kind of start to creep up. Uh, and then after halftime, it'll kind of kind of go down a little bit. So you can, it's a little, it, it's kind of neat to see how it, how it flows with the activity of, uh, of the people in our community. So yes, very good. All right, John. Azul, were there any other questions you wanted to? Uh, no more questions than the, I, I saw. Okay. Oh. You can go on. Okay, great. So we're going to go on to the next process. We, we just finished going through the screening process, which, which removes the large objects. <clears throat> and now we're going to go to the uh, grit chamber. So the, the purpose of the grit chamber is to remove exactly what it, its namesake is, grit. It removes grit, it removes eggshells, things, things like that. You want to remove these uh, smaller, uh, denser particles because you want to protect downstream equipment. So imagine if uh, you know you have okay. So imagine you had a bicycle, right? You're not going to put sand in your chain. That would wear out your chain and your sprockets. And this and this is why we want to remove um, uh, the the sand and the eggshells and things like that in this process. And you saw from the video, the water is very turbulent, moves very quickly. Um, we just want to remove the smaller dense particles and then allow the uh, um, the organics to continue on downstream. All right, so next we're gonna to go to the primary settling tanks. I don't know if you guys can see that, okay. <clears throat> so the purpose of the primary settling tanks is to slow the water way down. Let's see if I get a bit of, here we go. So we wanna slow the water way down so we get um, any, you know, whatever's in the water to float or to sink. And so when they float or they sink, we'll collect that. Uh, anything that floats will collect, anything that sinks it will collect. And so if you look in the video here, you can see these, these boards, these launders it's called, they're on a chain of flight system. And so they transverse down the, uh, the tanks and they collect the material that's floated and they also collect the material that, that, um, that has sunk. And I'll show you another picture of it. Okay, so here's what it looks like inside a tank. These tanks are, are approximately 10 feet deep. And you can see the chain off to the right, the boards, if you will, here. And so it just rotates around and it collects material and, and uh, brings it to a hopper at one end. And then the hopper collects it and pumps it out. And I got a, a short video on that as well. <clears throat> you can kind of see it rotating around and it conveys uh, material to one end of the tank where it's collected and that's called sludge as you see here. And as it says in the title, we remove about 60% of the um, pollution in the water at this point. So we'll see some plastics uh, that'll be floating in here. Um, you know, and then maybe some food particles, things like that. 
And then I also want to show you this here. Oh, it's not playing. Oh, looks, we had a video, but it's not playing. So this is the uh, the galleries that are located below ground, right next to the uh, primary tanks. So what what's kind of cool about at least the virtual tour is that we can show these to you. Normally we don't show these during our, our regular tours. Um, and so you can see all these pipes that are running down the gallery itself. These pipes go into the walls, as you see right down here. And that's where the hopper is within the tanks. And to the right is the tanks here. You can see this is tank number six. And so we collect this sludge from the tanks. And as we, when we collect the sludge, then it goes to our anaerobic digesters for further processing. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But um, I thought it was kind of neat to show this um, in the bridge tour itself. Does anybody have any questions on the primary tanks? Uh, no, not on primary tanks. Okay. All right. So I'll go to the next process. By the way, oh, well, let me ask you this question. So in the beginning, I mentioned that we use three mechanisms for cleaning water. One is physical, one is biological, and the next is uh, chemical. Would you guys say this is a physical, biological, or chemical type of process, the primary tanks? Let's see, uh, Acela, would you like to take a guess? It's a physical removal? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, because we're getting stuff to float and we're getting stuff to sink. That's physical separation. And then we're collecting that stuff and we're moving it out of the water. <clears throat> Very good, awesome. All right, so next we're gonna move on to the uh, secondary process. As you can see here, um, we got the uh, biological tanks, we've got the secondary clarifiers, and then we're also gonna talk about our anaerobic digesters and uh, uh, the dissolved uh, flotation, air flotation tank. All right, so here's an overview of the biological treatment. This is considered the heart of the treatment plan itself. And as you can see here, we got uh, several uh, different tanks. The water spends about four hours in this process before going to the next process. Oh, by the way, something I, I want to mention earlier on is that, um, well, let me ask you this. How, how long do you think it takes to treat water from beginning to end? Does anybody want to take a guess? It takes four hours in the biological process, but there's other processes in it as well. Does anybody want to take a guess how long it takes to uh, clean wastewater on average? We have Jackie, did you want to take a guess? Okay, if not Jackie, let's see. Uh, Eric? Eric, did you want to guess? Okay, we can't hear Eric. So um, in the chats, we're hearing uh, Susan takes a guess, 10 hours. Susan, that's pretty close, actually. It takes a total of 12 hours to treat water from the very beginning to the very end. So, <clears throat> so it's a... Uh, so it's a very, uh, a very quick process, as, as you see. It's only 12 hours to treat water from, from the beginning to the end. Um, so I'm gonna jump back over to the, uh, the biological process. So if you look at the tanks, you see some tanks are aerated, which is what you see here, and then some tanks are not. And the reason we do that is because we're, we have a different uh, community of microorganisms in each, in each tank. So we use microorganisms or employ microorganisms to clean our wastewater. So jumping back to the primary tanks, we removed the objects that float and the objects that sink. So we take the water that's in the center of that water column and that, and that water itself has a lot of, uh, or it has primarily dissolved waste in it. So we can't physically remove the dissolved waste. And so therefore we use the microorganisms to go in and eat that waste. So they eat our waste and that's how we remove it out of the water itself. And, and so in selecting certain microbes in our aeration and um, non-aerated tanks, this is uh, what we call an NDN process is what we're employing, a nitrification denitrification process. And the reason why is because we're, we want to remove ammonia out of the waste stream itself. Can anybody tell me why we would want to remove ammonia? 
Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, Samantha, would you like to take a guess? Um, I say because ammonia is toxic. Yes, that's exactly right. It's toxic to the aquatic environment, so we want to remove it. And so through this process, um, <clears throat> they'll first uh, nitrify, denitrify, and eventually become nitrogen gas. So the microbes do all, do all this work for us by removing uh, the ammonia. Um, and, and the eventual eventually becomes nitrogen gas. Do, let me ask you this, does anybody know uh, what our atmosphere is, uh, what percentage of our atmosphere is comprised of nitrogen gas? Uh, Jeremiah? Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah, you don't have the speaking feature. Let's see, does anyone else? Um, Drew, would you like to take a guess? Oh, never mind. He doesn't. Okay. No. Michael? Would Michael like to? Uh, okay, so someone in the chat said 78%. Karina. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's spot exactly on. It. So, so the reason I mentioned that is that um, <clears throat> it just shows that uh, nitrogen gas is not a pollutant. It does not affect, uh, it does not have a negative effect on the environment. And so that's why I wanted to, to bring that up. Um, okay, so we got a quick Someone video. asked how ammonia got there. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, part of it, part of the ammonia is from cleaning products, uh, a small percentage of it, but the majority of it actually comes from, from humans. It uh, comes from your urine. So think about it this way. Um, it's the middle of summer, maybe you've been playing soccer, you're very hot, you haven't been, really been um, drinking that much, you go use the restroom, you get a, a little bit more of an odor. That, that odor is, a, is ammonia. Um, and so the tree plant uh, receives the majority of its ammonia from, from humans and a little bit of it from cleaning products themselves. So I don't, I don't know if you guys uh, had a chance to look at this. So in this video that you just saw here, maybe I can replay it. Here we go. All right, so see the activated sludge, it goes in there. Um, and then this is, we aerate it. And then these are the microbes that you see that are do some of the work. This is just one example of micro, microbes in there. There's many other types in there. And we want a diverse community of microbes. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like this. So if we have a room full of people, um, well, let me ask you this. Can somebody tell me what their favorite food is? Anybody? Okay, we got one in the chat. Oh, someone put gorditas. Okay. Pizza, and, sushi. Okay, sushi, gordita. Anybody else have a favorite food? Um, those are the three guesses we've got. Okay, so so the answers were all different, which is it, it, which is perfect. So uh, the waste that we receive at the wastewater treatment plant is not all the same waste. It's not all pizza or it's not all sushi. It's a it's a uh, it. It's a, a huge, uh, it, it's varying waste, right? And so we want microbes of a diverse community to eat those different wastes. Some microbes will go for the sushi, some will go for the uh, gorditos, some will go for uh, the sushi, or I'm sorry, the pizza. So we want them to take up all of our waste and that's why we have the diverse community of microorganisms uh, in our plants to do that for us. Are there any questions on this? See, I think we played this already, so I will go to the next one. Oops. Okay, so, all right, so next we're going to the secondary settling tanks. And uh, the purpose of the secondary settling tanks is now that the microbes have done the work for us, we're gonna settle them out and we're gonna remove them from our water. We don't want the microbes uh, in our water. We want clean water at the, uh, at the end of the treatment process. Um, I thought I saw a hand- Are there up. vacuum pumps used for aeration? Oh, okay. So yes. Yeah. So the the treatment plants they use compressors to um, to bubble water into the system itself in order to uh, to provide oxygen to the microbes. Um, so we have com compressors at the plant. Each compressor is actually a thousand horsepower compressor. So it's it's a very big compressor, 
they provide about 21,000 CFM of flow each. So there's a lot of air that gets pumped into it. And the compressors are actually one of the major expenses in a wastewater treatment plant. It takes a lot of power to pump air into the, the tanks in order to aerate them for the microbes. So did I answer your question? Maybe? Okay. Hope so. Okay. Oh, right. wait. Um, I think Edward has a question while we're here. Edward, did you want to ask? Uh, hello. Hi, Edward. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I work with vacuum pumps and I've, I'm very interested in how they work in uh, wastewater treatment sites. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've never seen it before and I, I look forward to getting a tour and, and checking it out sometime. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Edward. Edward. So <clears throat> when we do a physical tour, um, if you're able to make it out uh, to one of our plants, uh, please ask a question and we can certainly show you what those uh, pumps look like. They're, they're very big, yes. Yeah, and we'll, p we'll post all our upcoming tours on social media so you can follow along there. And then Seth, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was wondering where the microbes come from and how they are introduced, just kind of what that process looks like. I have trouble kind of visualizing what exactly that, that looks like. Okay, yeah, uh, awesome. So um, back in 20, okay, so how this plant was uh, introduced, or the microbes introduced to this plant, uh, back in 2012, we upgraded this plant from a secondary plant uh, treatment system to a tertiary uh, plant. And in doing so, what we did is we seeded the, um, the aeration tanks. And how we did that is we went to one of our other plants and we pumped out the, the, the uh, microbes or the, the water out of the, their, their biological tanks, transported it up to here, and then we dumped it in the tanks. Uh, we added more water, uh, air. We, we basically kind of grew them or cultivated them. And once they reached, uh, a level of maturity, then we started the treatment process itself. Technically though, um, and I remember uh, when I was back in college, a uh, professor brought it up as like, hey, how do you start a treatment plant? Well, you just pick up a handful of dirt. There's a lot of microbes, uh, bacteria in the dirt itself, and you could actually start your own uh, treatment plant uh, that way. However, um, it, it's a big jump start for us by taking, um, uh, what we call mixed liquor, the, the microbes uh, out of a, a different treatment plant and bring them up here and then and then put them into the reactor uh, for for processing. So that's answer your uh, question? Yeah, so um, is there any solar or green energy that's used to run these pumps? Um, <clears throat> so the sanitation districts is always looking at ways to uh, cut costs and, and uh, be a little more efficient. We currently do not have a solar system uh, installed at this plant. Uh, however, there are uh, there is one in design right now, and we're looking at it and and uh, you know and looking to install it at Palmdale and also our our Lancaster plant. So that's that's under consideration. Um, as always, we look at the the numbers uh, to make sure that it's uh, cost efficient for our ratepayers to to move on something in order to uh, install the system or whatever it is, or whatever upgrade that we're looking to do. So, yeah. Okay, thanks, we can move on. Okay, all right, so, so moving on to the secondary settling uh, tanks. Um, they're very much like the primary settling tanks. And um, here we, uh, here's another view of the inside of the secondary clarifier. You can see it looks, it looks very much like the primary settling tanks. You got these uh, these chains on the bottom. You got these boards that go across, and they and they just kind of go around and they collect anything that may float, and then anything might sink. Um, <clears throat> and so we slow the water way down. These microbes are just a little bit heavier than water, which is good for us. And and so we're able to settle them out, sink them, uh, and they'll sink down, and then we'll collect them, and then um, we'll um, uh, either put them back into the process itself or uh, we'll do what you call wasted, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. So I kind of want to show you what the water looks like that we're, we're removing out of the secondary settling tanks. You can see we have these troughs here, and um, 
these uh, weirs that look kind of like al alligator teeth. They're, you can kind of see the alligator teeth there. And, and so what we're doing is that we're slowly removing the water out of the tanks itself. We're scalping that water off. And the reason why we do that is because we want to not disturb this water as much as possible. We want those microbes to settle out as best as we possibly can and, and just take the cleanest part of the water out of the system. And so that's why we have uh, these long troughs in here that remove the water. And so here's a picture of what the water looks like coming out of the settling tank. See, it's, it's fairly clean at this point and we're not even finished. We're, we're a little more than halfway through the treatment process itself, but the water is very clean. And um, we're gonna continue on the process to uh, continue to clean it. Is there any questions on the secondary settling tanks? No, you're good, move on. Thank okay. You. All right. So <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, some of that, some of those microbes that are collected off the secondary settling tanks are, are what we call wasted. And so what we do is we send them to the DAF, the dissolved air flotation tanks, which is what you see here. And the purpose of the DAF is to remove excess water uh, uh, from that uh, biological sludge, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and we want to remove that excess water because that biological sludge is then gonna be transported over to digesters uh, for treatment. And we don't wanna take up our digester space with just water. We wanna have, uh, we wanna maximize that uh, treatment as best we can. Uh, and, and so we have a higher concentration of uh, sludge in there than we do uh, uh, water is what we're looking for. So we're gonna move on to the digesters, which is next in the process. And here you can see, uh, overview of uh, digest yourself. You see a lot of pipes there. So these pipes are used for transporting uh, material or sludge into the digester, taking it out, and also um, removing gas. We, we do produce um, some methane gas. Somebody asked earlier about uh, green energy. Uh, so this kind of relates to us. So what we do is we collect that methane and then we use it in our steam boilers to heat water to generate steam. And then the steam in turn is injected into the digesters to heat it. Now your digesters is very much like your stomach. It's anaerobic, there's no, no air. It's uh, heated to about 100 degrees. Um, unlike your stomach, however, the, the material spends about 30 days in the digesters before it goes on to, uh, to the next process. And the digesters, uh, what they do is they, um, <clears throat> they reduce uh, volume, reduce odors, and they also eliminate the microorganisms that can cause uh, disease. As you see uh, in your lower left-hand screen, there's uh, bacteria that are, are feed on the solids. You can see kind of the bacteria kind of going around looking for the food and eating it. And so again, here we're using the bacteria to our, our, uh, our benefit. Uh, we do have five digesters on site. Uh, they range anywhere from uh, 600,000 uh, gallons to 1.5 million gallons uh, in, in size. Does anybody have any questions at this point? You're fine, you, you can move on. Okay, great. <clears throat> so after the sludge has been in the uh, digesters for a while, uh, it's then sent to the dewatering building. And these are these equipment here, these are uh, centrifuges is what they're called. And that's what we use to dewater the sludge. And the purpose of dewatering the sludge is to reduce volume, and to uh, reduce weight by removing the water. And I have a video here to kind of show you how the centrifuge works. So you can see the solids are entering into the centrifuge. It spins around and it separates uh, the water from the solids. The solids are pushed out front, as you see here, and then the water goes out the back. And the, the water is technically is called centrate, is what it's called. And so that's how we separate that. And then after that, we will take those solids and we'll store them uh, at our 40th Street property over here, which is an overview of what you see here. And so these are different beds that we store our solids in, and these are the biosols themselves after, after we've treated them on, plant, uh, on the plant. And then <clears throat> uh, we have a contractor that comes up, picks up the biosols, and then transports it to a company called Synegro and uh, Synegro composts it, and those biosolids are uh, beneficially reused. Beneficially reused. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back over to the 
treatment plant itself. We're going to go to the tertiary treatment uh, part of the plant itself. So after the secondaries, we're going to jump over to the secondary effluent basin. So we're jumping over now. So here's a, here's a picture of the equalization tank itself. And I have a video that kind of overshow, uh, or shows the overview of it. You see how big it is. So the perp, there's a couple of purposes for the equalization tank. The first purpose is uh, for emergency storage. So if we have an issue with any of the equipment in the back half of the plant, we could store water here on a temporary basis uh, while we make repairs. And then once we make repairs, we can, we can then uh, continue on with the treatment process. That hasn't happened yet. We've, everything's uh, ran pretty well. Uh, so we haven't had to use it as emergency storage. It also uses, we also use it for uh, flow equalization uh, in the later half of the plant. Now, if you remember earlier, we talked a little bit about how the flow kind of goes up and down throughout the day and how we have these peaks like at Thanksgiving and, and uh, during the Super Bowl. So what this tank does is by equalizing out the flow in the last half of the plant, it steadies out the flow. And that makes it a lot easier for the operators to, to treat it. So they can just have a steady state flow going into the um, filtration units and then on to disinfection. So in the disinfection process is where we really benefit from this. So if you think about it, if the flow's going up and down and we have to maintain a certain amount of disinfection, we're always kind of chasing that curve as we're applying uh, disinfection. Or, uh, and so uh, by having a steady state curve, the operators can just really tune in on it. And by doing so, that saves us chemical costs down uh, in the long run. And so it's a cost saving measure as well as a uh, emergency storage measure. Do you guys have any questions so far? Keep going. Yeah, please, please keep going. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's the cloth media filters here. We have six units, each unit separate. Okay. And so let's look inside to see what the cloth uh, filters look like. Here's a close up of the cloth filters. And you can see the water over it. These are the filters themselves. And I got a video here in a second to kind of show how it works. And so these filters, they filter out some of the finer particles that that the secondary settling tanks were not able to remove. Here's a video kind of showing how it works. And so the water surrounds the filters itself and it'll go in through the filter, as you see here, and then into the center. And then from there on out. And so uh, another reason why we want to filter before we get to the disinfection is um, think about it this way. If, if there's a microbe out there, it could, it could be possibly surrounded by, um, you know, maybe you know, some, some material. And when we go to the disinfection process, the uh, chlorine won't be able to reach those microbes. And so uh, that, that wouldn't be, um, uh, and so we want, to, we want to make the water as safe as we can. And so by filtering all that out and getting the cleanest water we can before the disinfection process, that, that'll maximize the, the treatment of the, um, uh, of the water itself. And so here's a photograph of the uh, cloth filters. <clears throat> And here's a photograph of one of the wedges that are in the cloth filter. So if you were here uh, and you were to rub your hand up on the cloth filter itself, it would feel very much like a shaggy carpet. It's um, kind of kind of like a '70s van if you if you ever see one of those. Uh, it, it's shaggy carpet and, and and filters out the the um, the water. All right. So next we'll move on to the disinfection process. Moving over the chlorine contact tanks. Okay, so if you're looking at the chlorine contact tanks, we spent, uh, we spent about uh, four hours in this process as well. Um, and you'll see that these tanks are covered. Can anybody tell me why we would want to cover the, the tanks where all of our other tanks are uncovered?
Anybody have a guess or? Susan? Um, it seems that this is the cleanest the water has gotten so far, so you want to keep it clean. Yes, that is that is one reason why we, we would want to cover it. We wouldn't want mm -hmm. um, birds uh, dropping anything in there. We don't want dust or any of that to get in there either. But there's also so, another reason. Does anybody else have a, want to make a guess? Yeah, Kim in the chat said, uh, because chlorine evaporates. Yes, that is exactly right. So. So if anybody <clears throat> has a pool at home, you know that during the summer months, you add a lot more chlorine than you do in the winter months. Uh, and that's because this, the sun evaporates, uh, you know, or uh, takes away the, the chlorine. And so by adding these, these um, covers to it, it's a cost savings measure that, that helps us to reduce our chlorine or chemical cost. And uh, also, uh, as Susan mentioned, it, it keeps any dust and dirt and things like that out of the, the water after we've worked so hard to get it clean to this point. And so here's another overview of the tanks themselves. And here's the water that comes out. You see it's very clean. If, you, if we were on the, the tour itself and we were standing here, you would have a, um, you'd be able to smell uh, 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 chlorine in the water itself. It just smells very much like a swimming pool. Uh, very clean, clean water. And so here's a comparison between the start and the end uh, of the treatment process. And you see the, the jar on the left is a is a sample of raw wastewater, and on the right is the cleaned product itself. And so next we're going to jump over to um, uh, storage and, and use of the water. Can you? Go ahead. Sorry, can you um, explain to us real quick why the why we chose cloth filters over sand filters? Oh yeah, so yeah, it's a great question. So Palmdale's the only treatment plant in the district system that has cloth filters. So one of the advantages of cloth filters is that uh, the size of it or the amount of real estate or space it takes up is, is much smaller than a gravity filter. Um, so just to kind of give you a little background on a gravity filter, uh, we'll have um, different layers of media in the gravity filter itself, in, including uh, carbon. The water will come, be dropped basically down onto a bed of that media, including the carbon, and be filtered on through. And that's how that process works. With cloth media filters, it's sort of the same thing. It, gravity flows through the filter itself, and, and then and then the, it goes on to that point. So the the cloth media filters, uh, uh, they can handle a little bit more of a load, I believe, and also the, the amount of space that they, they take is much less than a uh, gravity filter would take. So, did that answer your question, Genesis? I hope so. And um, what's the chlorine contact time? Uh, approximately four hours. We spent about four hours in there, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, that's it. You can move on. So we, so it spends a lot of time in there to disinfect. There's other uh, ways to disinfect uh, water besides using chlorine. Does anybody, anybody want to make, make a guess of what some of those ways are? Let's see, Fran? Fran, did you want to take a guess? Um, I get, appears not. Okay, I, I don't want to, I, I want to ask a question on the cloth filters. Yeah. How often are they cleaned and are they cleaned or changed? Oh, great. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the cloth filters themselves, they go through a, um, a cycle of cleaning. Um, <clears throat> there's like a, a, a brush that goes along the cloth filter itself to brush off any, any material that's collected. And that's where we, uh, what you call backwash. So when that happens, we'll backwash, we'll pump water opposite through the filter itself or backwash through the filter. And then that water is sent to the front of the plant for, to go through the whole process again to be retreated. And that happens um, depending upon how, how much material collects on the filter. So the operators uh, through the DCS system, they'll be able to see um, using an um, analyzer called turbidity. 
and that turbidity meter tells them like, hey, you know, the, the, uh, the water's becoming dirtier, we need to backwash. And so the computer is set up to where once it reaches a certain value, it'll backwash. Now, just to jump back to turbidity, turbidity is basically, um, it tells you the amount of, uh, I'm gonna say junk in the water itself. And how it works is that uh, the analyzer will shoot a beam of light through the water and and on the other side of that um, light, a receptacle will say, will be able to determine how much light has gone through. Now, it knows how much it sends and it knows how much it receives. And so the difference between the two tells it how dirty the water is. So if that light hits any particle within the water, it'll be refracted off and not red on the, on the other side of, of that analyzer. And so that's how we're able to tell. And then to answer the second part of your question, how long we have to, or how often we have to change out those filters. Um, those filters were designed to be changed out every five years. Uh, however, you know, thanks to the hard work of, of Janine and, and the operators, we were actually able to extend that out uh, another year or two before having to change it out. And we, I think recently we just started changing out, out the filters cassette by cassette. So, yeah, thank you for asking a question. I appreciate that. All right, that's it. That's it. Okay. All right. All right. So, so we're looking at this this uh, slide here, and um, as Basil mentioned earlier, every every drop of water has to be managed, and so we built some reservoirs out uh, in the desert to house water. So there's times of the year that we need a lot of water, which is in the summer. It's a desert, arid environment, and then there's times we don't need a lot of water, which is uh, in the winter time. And so after treating this water, we want to um, we want to beneficially reuse it. And, and so what we do is we'll pump it out to the reservoirs and we'll store it there. Winter time we'll, st we'll store water and in the summertime we'll deplete these reservoirs. And I have a video showing the reservoirs themselves. Normally um, during the physical tours we'll, we'll have a bus and we'll bring everybody out here to kind of show you the reservoirs. So these reservoirs are each a mile long and in total, they store about 1 billion gallons, billion with a B. Um, just to add some, some um, uh, just to add a little information, uh, during the construction of these reservoirs, the, the material that we used uh, to, to build these berms was a little on the, on the sandy side. And so what we did was we added what you call soil cement to support these berms and, and, and that's what holds, uh, holds in the water or helps hold in the water. And <clears throat> we also have monitoring equipment out there as well. The, each of these reservoirs have uh, plastic liners in them so, so that they don't leak out. And at various spots along the, the reservoir, we have these uh, monitors that go underground to measure to make sure that there aren't any leaks. And so, we, so we do heavily uh, monitor them we also do physical inspection at least once a year, if not more. We'll go out there when the, when the water level is low and we'll, uh, we'll inspect those reservoirs. So that's a little bit of um, uh, some of the engineering uh, background behind the reservoirs. And so this water is used uh, mainly for uh, agriculture and irrigation, as you see here. Farmers use it to grow uh, fodder crops, which are used to feed uh, uh, farm animals and, and um, things like that. Okay, and here's the video showing uh, one of the crops. <clears throat> you can see uh, uh, a pivot right here. And so the pivot is uh, centered and what it does is it just sort of walks around. That's why you have this circular uh, pattern that you see here. And it just, it just slowly advances and uh, releases water for the crops to grow. And here's a close up of the, uh, of the pivot itself. You see the wheels, it just slowly goes along around the center and applies water. And so we also use the reclaimed water for uh, McAdam Park. And so by using uh, the reclaimed water, uh, not only for the park and also for agricultural, it saves our drinking water, which is a very precious resource, as you can imagine, uh, being up in the desert area for, for uh, use for other purposes. And so I think that is, yes, that is the conclusion.
of this um, this virtual tour. Can can I answer any questions for anyone or? Okay, great. Um, yes, we have a few questions. We have a few questions for you. Um, this the last one, are the reservoirs that you just talked about, were, are they exposed to the environment or do you place shade balls to prevent them from evaporating? Oh yeah, so um, <clears throat> no, yeah, they are, they are open to the environment like you saw in the video. Uh, so we do get some evaporation. Uh, we do, do account for that in our projections. We, we project how much water we're gonna have in the, in the um, reservoirs themselves. Uh, we, we determine how much water we're going to, you know, the, the farmers are going to need. Um, so we, we tightly manage that water. We, we track it very, very closely. Uh, we don't have any shade balls uh, in there. Um, as a matter of fact, we did look at doing that at one point um, and the, uh, the expense uh, outweighed the benefit. And so we elected to continue to operating as you see there. Yeah, that was a great question though. Okay, great. And then the main question that we got was, uh, what are the budgetary costs to operate and maintain the facility? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, Basil, do you happen to have uh, an idea what that may cost to run uh, the Palmdale facility on a annual basis? Um, I, I don't have that, that number off the top of my head either. Um, so I think if you leave your email um, out here in the Q&A, then we'll get back to you with that answer. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So another question, um, the shade balls that you mentioned, do they release plastic particles into the water? Um, well, we don't use any, uh, we don't use shade balls in our, um, our storage facilities. So no, we wouldn't have any any plastic material that would be entering our, our storage facilities. Okay, and who owns that water um, after, from the storage ponds? Um, well, the, the Palmdale uh, District 20 owns, owns the water. District 20 owns it. Okay, and uh, does the weather affect plant processes in any way? Um, <clears throat> Generally, I would say generally speaking, no. So somebody mentioned earlier that our flows could go up due to rain events. And, and that is true. We do see an uptick, uh, just a slight uptick uh, during rain events. And that's because of uh, infiltration. So you'll, so those manhole covers that you see on the roadways, um, water leaks in through them during, uh, maybe through rain events. Um, and that'll increase our flow slowly, but it doesn't significantly uh, affect it. Um, winter time, uh, when it gets cold, it can get freezing weather up here in the plants. And, and so what we've done is we'll insulate our, our pipes um, <clears throat> uh, wherever, wherever we need to. Um, and in the summertime, when it gets real hot, uh, we make sure that our electrical equipment is kept cool. We have AC units in our, in our buildings, um, things like that to, to kind of counter, counter the environment that way. But overall, the plant runs actually pretty good throughout the year. Okay, and um, a few questions, a few people ask questions about um, requesting this tour later or signing up for a physical tour. So I put the email down there in the chat box. Um, you can also follow us on social media because we're always posting our full calendar there. Um, or we're always posting upcoming tours. So once we go to back to physical tours and we'll let everyone know and then you can sign up. Yeah, that'd be um, great. And, yeah. and just to add, if you come out, uh, Wendy brings coffee and donuts. So we'll have uh, some coffee and donuts and, um, and go on the walking tour. And, and I, I highly encourage you to attend the Palmdale and, 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 and later on the Lancaster tours. These are some of the best tours, uh, in my, my opinion, of course. Um, because you see the whole process, you see everything and, and it's all within walking distance, it works great. Yeah, and Michael has a question, oh, Basil has a question. Um, I was able to look up the answer. The annual operating cost of the Palmdale plant is roughly $10 million a year. Wow, yeah, yeah 10 million. Yeah, and it's treating how many million gallons of water per day? Uh, average, like, flow, average flow is 10 million gallons per day. Okay. Average flow. 
the operation maintenance costs roughly $10 million a year. Perfect. Thank you, Basil. Okay. Um, Michael, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask your question or? Okay, uh, Fran, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, my question is, hi everybody. Uh, my question hi. is, uh, how about the mosquito uh, situation and the standing water in those reservoirs? Oh yeah, yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, so that's a great question too. So um, we do keep an eye out for that. I, I personally have not seen that as an issue out there. The, um, so the water, you know, it, it builds up during the winter and then it, and it goes down during, during the summer. And so um, we do actually go out there and inspect and, and make sure that we're, you know, uh, you know complying with all local, um, local standards. And we always do uh, look for things like that that may, may be an issue. And if it is, then we, then we address it. But so far, um, I have not uh, seen that as, a, as an issue out there, but that's a very good question. Very, very thank good. you very much. Yeah, thank you, Fran, for asking that. So, um, next question is, um, our, let's see, how is this water different from our tap water? Um, I guess the main difference is uh, it, would, it would apply to permit. So, you know, this water is not permitted to, um, uh, for drinking purposes. Um, is permitted for reuse and that's and so that's what we use it for uh, years ago uh, we don't do this anymore but years ago um, as a demonstration um, uh, you know we you know somebody may may drink the water just kind of demonstrate how clean it is but because it is not permitted to uh, for drinking water we don't we don't do that anymore but the water is it's very clean um, uh, so and, it's, it, and it essentially meets drinking water standards but California law doesn't allow uh, people to drink it. Perfect, oh, yes. Basil. You answered yeah. my next question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was a question in the chat about um, the jurisdiction of the sanitation district. Well, the Palmdale plant serves sanitation district 20, and that it's a local district, uh, it's sanitation, it's a special district, and it serves the city of Palmdale, unincorporated uh, Los Angeles County. So the board of directors are the mayor of Palmdale, the city council person from Palmdale, and the chairperson of Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. That was a question in the, in the chat. Okay. Um, so going back to the, the chlorine, how would you remove the chlorine from the water so that it doesn't damage the plants? And is there any other alternative that you could use for this final step? Um, yeah, so, so actually the chlorine um, does not damage the plants. Uh, it's, it's left in the water. Uh, when it's at the, so, so when the chlorine gets pumped out to the reservoirs, um, it, it kind of degrades over time, if you will. And so uh, certainly by the time it's used, there's, there's little chlorine in the water and doesn't affect uh, the plants uh, at all. Uh, and then the second part of the question is, is there alternative uh, disinfection methods, I think is what, what the question may be leading to. Yeah, there's there's other methods out there. Um, for example, UV is one method of disinfection. Um, it's also, it's a very effective disinfection uh, as well as chlorine. Uh, but one disadvantage of, of UV is that it's not persistent or chlorine is persistent in the water. And so once that water, you, you think about the water, once it enters the pipe, if you have chlorine in there, it continues to protect that water and keep it clean. So your drinking water at home actually has chlorine in it. And, and the reason why is to protect that water right up into the point to, to where you use it and, it, and it's safe for your, your use. Now, if we use UV, UV works great at the moment, but then once that water exits out into the pipe, it, it's no longer protected. Uh, it, you know, uh, the UV has done its work and it's, and it's, it's done at that point. Okay, um, thank you. Fran, you had a question? Yes, I had a uh, question. My qu well, a question is not, really not a question. Doesn't Palmdale have another 
plant, the purifying plant that is only for drinking water? I thought that's, I, uh, anyway, isn't there another plant that Palmdale has? Yes. That's right there on Avenue S? Yes, yes, there is, yes. Um, th that is not uh, owned or operated by the sanitation districts, but that is a, uh, a clean drinking water plant. You're absolutely correct about that. And they, they go through a, a treatment process as well. So I take that uh, off of Avenue S, you, you probably uh, seen the, the body of water there. So they'll take that water, they'll clean it, and, um, and then from there, they'll, they'll distribute it out to their rate payers. Yeah, and our function, we're tasked to clean up the sewage or wastewater. That's what we were created to do. It's probably, the Palmdale Water District probably provides the potable water. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a question in the chat about why does Santa Monica Bay get polluted after rainfall? And the, the, the biggest reason um, is basically trash or, um, you know, like, you know, people throw on the streets or oil. Um, basically stormwater runoff. The things that we didn't pick up or didn't take care of, when it rains, it flushes all the way to uh, Santa Monica Bay. For the folks in the Antelope Valley, as we showed you the picture of the, the closed basin, when it rains, it doesn't go towards Santa Monica Bay. It really goes towards, I guess, Edwards Air Force Base, because that's a low-lying area in the valley. Yes, and that sort of emphasizes the, you know, the need to, for us as individuals to be responsible in how we dispose of our waste. Um, you don't want to just, you know, if you change the oil in your car, you don't want to leave the oil on the ground or, or if it spills on the ground, you want to leave it there, you want to clean it up and, and properly dispose of it. And that way it doesn't get down to the oceans or in the streams or, or anywhere else. So what percentage of the water that re is reclaimed from the initial wastewater entering the treatment plant? Uh, it, it's actually all reclaimed. Um, all the water is reclaimed. So, so what the treatment plant does is it removes the, the quote unquote junk in the water itself. And so as, as we go through each step of the process, we'll, we'll clean out the water, we'll clean out the water, we'll clean out the water, and then the end product is, is all all of the water itself. Are septic tanks better or worse from a sustainability perspective than this process? Um, I mean, they, they work, right? So it, it's somewhat similar process to what we do here at the plant there. So if you have a septic tank, you'll have like a, a holding tank uh, that will, will accept the waste, there's microbes in it that eat it and break it down. And then from there it goes to um, uh, a distribution or a, uh, I forget what the name of it is. It's a field where water is distributed out and, 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 and then uh, percolates back in the ground. So I, I, I mean, there's pluses and minuses of each. Um, you know, they work and they've, they've been in effective, uh, a properly running um, septic system ha has, uh, you know, has been deemed safe. Um, so we, you know, a septic system works good as well as a treatment plant. I would say though that um, if you have an opportunity to connect to a treatment plant, um, that would be uh, more beneficial to you as a homeowner because uh, now you, you don't have to worry about the upkeep and maintaining that system. And plus you know that your waste is gonna get properly uh, treated and the water is gonna get reused uh, beneficially. So there's, there's some benefits to doing that. And by and large, um, our sewer, the unit cost for a home on a sewer system is less than the cost of a home on a septic tank. And, and historically, you know, I mean, we, most people take care of their septic tank, but you just need one bad apple where it could start polluting your groundwater. And that's why the sewer system, especially communities that have polluted groundwater, they try to switch over to a sewer system or a sewer system. So the next question is, um, <clears throat> do you, LA water is very drinkable compared to San Bernardino. Do you know why? I do not. I, I assume we're referring to potable water um, and I'm not familiar with the, um, the treatment systems between the two um, uh, counties. So I couldn't, okay. 
I couldn't really answer that. Is this sis, is this system similar to ones used in other countries? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's 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 a very uh, similar system. You're always going to go through those same processes where you you have your physical treatment, you'll have your biological treatment, and then you have your chemical treatment. And 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 it and in the process itself could vary from country to country. There could be different types of you know primary settling tanks or uh, secondary uh, processes themselves. Um, there could be little variations on how it's treated, but the the basics of it are are the same. Okay, and how often is the fundamental process reviewed or re-engineered? Oh, so um, <clears throat> so we're always looking at ways to the sanitation districts is always looking at ways to reduce costs and to uh, provide a better product to, to our repairs. So we're always looking at new technologies. We, we thoroughly evaluate them before we employ them. Um, <clears throat> so for, you know, just on a basic level, for example, if we have a pump that goes out and we need to replace that pump, we'll look at replacing that pump, but then we'll also consider if there's other pumps out there that may be uh, more cost effective, maybe more energy efficient pumps that we could replace that pump with. So we're always looking at ways of improving the process in that manner. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, what is done with the ammonia that is removed from the water? Oh, so that ammonia is uptaken by the microbes through the NDN nitrification, denitrification process. And, and so that's how um, uh, that ammonia is removed and then it's converted to um, to uh, nitrite and then to nitrate and then on to nitrogen gas. So there's a, there's a conversion as you go along with that ammonia to eventually become uh, nitrogen gas and, and not have any uh, detrimental effects on the environment. Thank you. Uh, so towards the beginning when you were talking about the compactor that removes like all the large objects mm -hmm. uh, from primary, uh, someone asked if those smell. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. they, they're odorous, yeah. Yeah, they can be a little odorous, but it's, it's not um, overwhelming, but it, it, it does have that um, uh, odor to it, so yes. Okay, um, next question. Would using our trash disposals help more? To break it down, to break oh, down. Oh, okay, way. yeah, so, um, so that's a good point. So. The um, the trash you're talking you're talking about in the sink, right? Where you grind it up and, and it goes down. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So so when you do that, what that does is it adds uh, what we call BOD or biological oxygen demand to the water system itself, and um, and what that does is it you're adding more food, if you will, into the wastewater, which then has to be removed by the microbes. Uh, so it increases the BOD, which increases the load on the plant itself. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's a, a bad thing to, you know, grind up your vegetables and, and, and put it down the, uh, the drain. Um, uh, just be aware that it does add, add a, a, a bit of a load to it. Um, there is one thing you don't want to put down your, um, uh, your drain, and that is uh, grease. Uh, why? Can anybody tell me why you would not want to put grease down your, your drain? Fats, oils, and grease. Yes, that's, thank you. Yes, fats, oils, and grease. Any guesses? Uh, no, we have no guesses. Could you tell us? Okay, yeah. So Actually, John wants to guess. Hold on, sorry. John, would you like to take a guess? Sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my guess is that it coagulates in the pipes. Yes, you're you're exactly right, John. So so maybe you remember your parents or your grandparents um, cooking, and then they have a like a milk container or something next to the stove itself. And then after they're done, they always pour the grease into that milk container, and <clears throat> and after that grease has cooled off, it solidifies, as you said, John. And then uh, and then at that point, then you take and you throw in the trash. But if you put it down the drain, what happens is that it'll solidify in your pipes 
and then you got to call out um, Mr. Reuter to come and clean out your pipes, and and uh, that could be a little expensive. Um, also, if the if the the grease or fats or oils make it into the treatment system itself or into the pipes uh, that lead to the wastewater treatment, that creates an issue uh, as well. And so the sanitation districts has these crews that go out on a daily basis, and they do uh, a cleaning process. They use a you maybe you've seen it, it's a huge truck has a, a, a tank at the back, and then they'll stop in the middle of the street where a manhole is, uh, they'll pop the cover, and they'll put down this hose. And this hose is like a big um, uh, sprayer is what it is. And it just goes down the line and it cleans out uh, those fats, oils, and greases that have collected on the pipes itself. Because we, we don't want to back up those pipes because uh, once it starts backing up, then, then bad things happen. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. And there were a few questions about posting um, this video up. You'll notice uh, we are recording it. So we will be posting this on social media. Primarily, it, it'll be posted through YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com uh, or your app, you can look up the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts, hit subscribe, and you'll get notified the minute we put up, the minute we upload this video. Um, if not, you can just follow us on social media and we'll make the announcement when that video goes up. Um, all right, so next question. Um, after painting our homes, how should we clean those brushes and tools? Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, awesome. I, I like using paint as an example of how to dispose of uh, hazardous waste in a household. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a question back to you. So if you have... Um, excess paint, right? So let's say, you know, you're, you, you paint your room pink and you think it's awesome, but only for a year. Then after that, you're like, oh man, I should have used a gray. So you have this leftover can of, of paint pink, uh, a, a pink paint. Uh, what, what do you think a disposal method of that paint is? And I'll, I'll get to the brushes question in a second. But what do you think you should do with the, um, the leftover paint? Uh, so There's actually a couple of things you can do. Uh, there's special recycling centers for leftover paint and sometimes they take pharmaceuticals as well and other things, gas, oil, etc. Yeah, yeah, I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut sorry. you off. Yes, yeah, so this, this program is, I like to call it my baby. Um, it's the Household Hazardous Waste and Electronic Waste Program. Um, if you go to our website, which actually I'll put it on the chat, um, it's www.lacsd.org slash HHW. So if you visit that site, you'll get a list of all of our free events throughout LA County. We're at a different city every single Saturday. Um, there's one going on right now, actually. Um, so, <gasps> oh shit, they're, they're all free. So they're all free. Um, so yeah, please, please feel free to, to visit us and you can dispose of your paint, your fluorescent light tubes, your batteries, uh, any electronics, old laptops that you don't want anymore. Um, is there anything I'm missing, John? Oh, car batteries, that counts yeah. too. Yes. That, yeah, that counts too. And um, there is a location in Palmdale. There's actually a location in Palmdale. We have some in Santa Clarita. Today, we're actually out in Pomona. Um, next week we'll be out, out in Carson and Compton, but we do have one uh, in Palmdale area. It's open every first and third Saturday of the month, and it's at the AVEC Center. So I don't have the address at the top of my head. Oh, it's 1200 West City Ranch Road in Palmdale, and that's open first and third Saturday of every month from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And so I'll put that information on the chat. And so again, cell phones, electronics, fluorescent lights. Yeah, and, it, and it's all free. It's, it's an awesome program to where you can dispose of your, your waste at no cost to you whatsoever and, and um, preserve the environment. I, I would also like to add uh, for paint, um, if you have a half a can of paint and you try to get rid of it and, um, and you don't have a way, there's no, um, hazardous waste disposal program in your community, one way you can get rid of it is by uh, getting a big piece of cardboard and pouring the paint on it and drying it out. And then you can throw it away. Once it becomes a solid like that, it's no longer considered hazardous waste. 
and your uh, local um, landfill will be able to accept it. And then the second part of the question, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh no, no worries. Uh, then there's a question of how you clean your brushes. So, so for myself, what I like to do is if I have a, uh, a brush that I plan on reusing uh, with the same paint color, preferably, um, I'll wrap it in plastic or, or I'll, I'll somehow seal it up so that way I don't have to uh, use water to clean it up and then to, to reuse it again at some point. But if I was going to clean up the brush and then use it for something else, um, I would just use a bucket of water uh, and then I put the brush in it and I'll clean it out and then I'll let that water sit out and e evaporate. And, and then once uh, it's evaporated, you have the solids and it's no longer considered hazardous waste and you can dispose of it that way. Uh, also, you could just take that, that water itself to the hazardous waste uh, roundups, right? Yeah, so yeah, lacsd.org slash HHW. And then also, if you want something immediately, specifically for paint, um, you can go to paintcare.org. You type in your zip code, wherever you're from in the US, and it'll give you your, your nearest location that'll accept paint for free. So it'll probably take you to like uh, Sherman Williams or Lowe's, any one of those. But just go to paintcare.org to see if uh, to see what's closest to you. Um, Fran, did you have a question? No, I just wanted to bring up. We also here in Lancaster have uh, an, uh, our Lancaster uh, maintenance yard that takes in all those. Uh, 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 things that you want to dispose of, the light bulbs and paints and anything like that. And it's on H on um, 5th Street. Um, I don't have the exact address right now, but it's a Lancaster maintenance yard on H, Avenue H. Awesome. I just thought I'd give you, you know, that information. Awesome. Yeah, okay. thank you, Fran. Appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. So we have a few more questions left. Um, the water um the water that we get from our faucets has that gone through our plant or is that different no no that is that is different um that water has uh, uh the water we we treat is is uh is reclaim water uh, although it, it is treated to drinking water standards which which is title 22 standards uh we do not use our water for for drinking we use it for other purposes which then saves that valuable drinking water resource to be used for drinking and, and that sort of thing, so. Okay, mm -hmm. so last question. Are there some operational challenges or interferences unique to the plant in relation to upstream communities and businesses? Um, I, I don't know if I would really call them challenges, more just normal operating procedures. So. So in, in terms of community and what may be in it, uh, the, there are some industry in it, as, as you're kind of indicating too, and that industry uh, could uh, increase the waste load, if you will, onto into the plant itself. And so we have a hazardous, uh, or not a hazardous, but a industrial waste program that the district operates. And, uh, those, and so those businesses are permitted uh, through that program uh, for the particular waste that they're trying to, or they want to dispose of it down the drain. And so uh, we'll have inspectors that'll go to their facilities, we'll talk to them, we'll see what their needs are, and then we'll, we'll proceed from there. Basil, did you wanna add anything? Okay. Um, what type of edu educational training do you need to work at the water reclamation plant? That's a great question, David. Oh yeah. Um, Janine, can I put you on the spot for that? Do you want to answer or you want me to give it a go? I'm not sure. Maybe you stepped out for a second. Been... There you are. Hey. <laughs> to be an operator? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Um, you just need to do um, classes through Ken Carey, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, Treatment Operator. And you can obtain those classes through the um, Sacramento University of Sacramento online. And then apply once you've completed volume one and volume two. Okay. How long does it normally take an operator to complete those volumes? If it can take 
two to three weeks. It depends on the operator. It's all done online. So there's a quiz at the end of each chapter and you submit your quiz online to the um, uh, Sacramento State University. Okay, and, and um, just, to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep asking. Uh, so <laughs> so what uh, what's the starting pay for an operator? Oh, I, I can look that up. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I'm thinking it's, I got a number in my head, but I may be mistaken uh, on it. Um, let me see really quick what the, what a starting pay might be. And so there's other um, occupations within the uh, treatment plan as well. So, you know, we, we need mechanics, we need electricians, um, occasionally we'll need an engineer. Um, we also have lab personnel uh, on site. So there's uh, several different disciplines that, that um, maintain and operate uh, a treatment plan. I think it's, um, let me see. It, it's about $6,000 a month. Okay, so. So a little over sixty thousand dollars a year starting out. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty good actually. That's actually very plus good. Plus benefits, seventy. Oh yeah, yeah. Plus your benefits, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a great job. Perfect. Um, and then you talked about the other one. Oh, and someone that's a great comment. Rio Hondo College also has classes to teach future operators. That so is correct. They have a really good program. Rio Hondo and I think LA Trade Tech. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I believe College of the Canyons is starting to have a pretty good um, wastewater program too, where they do can carry classes. Okay. Great. Um, perfect. Uh, so then, oh, how can we get information on internships? Well, well, I'll, I'll say one answer first. Um, so we post them on our social media. So if you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, we'll post any internships on there, or you can also check our website, lacsd.org. So I'll post that in the chat. I'll post that in the chat, and then um, you'll see right there. You click on careers, and you'll see if there are any internships available. And then, John, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so uh, I'll just, yeah, so. So when it comes to internships, and, and I'm glad that question was asked you, so when you're getting to that point to where you're looking for employment, internship is a great segue into the employment. And, and so when, say if you're in a college years and you get to your junior, senior year, um, you wanna look for an internship and, and uh, get that job. And, there, and there's a few reasons why. One, it, it kind of gives, you know, by getting an internship, you get to work for a company that you think you're going to want to work for. And it also, on the other side of it, think about it, the, the company gets to look at you. So when you graduate, if you're an intern um, and you, you've done a great job for them and, and you enjoy your job and you apply, um, your chances of getting employment with that company is, is much greater than if you're just somebody off the street who just graduated. Uh, you also get that uh, work experience. And you can take that with you wherever you go. So it's it's. I highly encourage everyone to um, when you get close to, you know, graduating to get an internship. Um, it's a lot of benefits to it. A lot, a lot of benefits to it. Yeah, and I know uh, specifically if you're taking operator classes, and your professors will notify you. Or they're also posted on cawaterjobs.org. Yeah as well so californiawaterjobs.org ca i'll put i'll put that in the chat too so i think the last question we have for now are there any future plans to move the plant towards um advanced water treatments such as reverse osmosis or uv disinfection i know you touched a little bit on uv but um not at the not at not at our plant now there's no immediate plans uh, or near future plans for for doing that here Okay, cool. And I think um, that's all of our questions. Again, um, if you missed the first part or would like to see the, the tour again, please go to our YouTube 
channel, um, just type in Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. I can type in the URL here as well. Hit subscribe and you'll get notified as soon as, um, as soon as it's posted. And I think that is it. So thank you very much everyone for coming. We had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. I hope your questions were answered. And if you had anything else or you think of something later, feel free to reach out to us at info at lacsd.org. Yeah, thank you everybody. It was, it was great. I appreciate the questions everybody asked also. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I posted the link. I posted our YouTube uh, URL mm. on the chats. So thank you again and hope to see you. We have Lancaster next week. So if you're interested to learn more about the Lancaster Water Reclamation Plant, we'll be here next week at 9 a.m. And I think that's all I have left to plug. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fran raised her hand. Oh, Fran. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have a, because I had trouble finding the, the link for today. Will you be uh, emailing, uh, mailing us the link for next, for next, the next, show, the next program on the 17th? Because I couldn't find you. That's why I had to call you, uh, Genesis. Um, yeah, I can put the, the link. I can put the link to it right here on the chat. Okay. Or if I have your email, I can, I can email it to you too. Okay. I'll get I'll get it right now and I'll post it on the chat. Okay, thank you. If you go to lacsd.org slash tours, you'll you'll see all our tours listed for the year. But the, I, I went there and I didn't see it. Also, oh. if you go on lacsd.org and you click on the community outreach, oh, that's how I found it. Oh, okay. And well, then I... the tours are all on there. So yeah. if you're not familiar with putting in extra addresses just click on community outreach and scroll down and the link's right there oh okay well thank you i didn't know it's, that uh, go ahead it's on, it's on the chat right now friend oh, thank you very much so if you thank you it, everybody it it'll great. take it to lancaster thank you friend thank you yeah, thank you friend email me if if anything else comes up okay thank you my email. all right thank you all right and that's it thank you everybody thank you and thank you, you. Well, your Saturday. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.